thanks for joining me uh, on the on, for coming on the program. Um, and you're joining me from Damascus, right? That's right. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for your time, uh, right. Professor. It's really, really lovely to have you on. Welcome. Uh, so the, the the first thing I wanted to talk about is the um, rapprochement or normalization of ties with Syria. Uh, what do you think is behind this change in attitude? Uh, what, what what has changed the 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 equation here? Uh, is it the president, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, or perhaps the advance of Yemeni forces as the the Houthis are part of the resistance axis? Why exactly are we seeing so many Arab uh, countries change their position in regards to Syria? Yes, it's related to the whole region. You're right in that respect. And of course, the US has always seen the whole region as uh, its project, not individual wars. You know, there's been at least eight wars, arguably nine if we include Bahrain in the last 20 years. And that's part of a project that was given a name, the New Middle East, um, 15 years ago by Condoleezza Rice when she was in Jerusalem just before the Israelis invaded Lebanon again. So what's been happening is they've been losing several wars, as you mentioned. Um, they withdrew from Afghanistan. They have a schedule to withdraw what they call combat troops from Iraq. Um, you know, that may be weasel words there. They are certainly in discussions at the moment to withdraw troops from Syria. And as you, uh, as you pointed out, the, the Saudis uh, are in trouble in Yemen and they've been suing for peace for the last couple of years, but they haven't proposed any decent sort of terms. So I think in that context, and also in the context of the contradictions of the economic blockade, let's not call them sanctions, the economic blockade against most of the independent countries here and the peoples of the region here, um, the US, is, or the Biden administration, let's say, has had to start to make some adjustments. It made some adjustments for Lebanon when the country was uh, on the verge of starving and not having any fuel. Um, there was pressure from the Emiratis who actually uh, went and normalized with uh, Damascus th uh, three years ago. And then Trump, of course, used that against them to force them to normalize with Israel. And he blackmailed them on that one. But nevertheless, the Emiratis wanted to get back. And having, having lost the war of all the proxy armies they'd sent into Syria, the, some of those countries really, for their own reasons of investment and trade and whatever, wanted to re-establish ties with Syria and not be completely excluded. And so Jordan was the other one. Jordan, probably the weakest of all of the Arab countries, um, totally dependent on its relationship with the US, um, also uh, did some sort of normalization recently. So I think you're seeing them, uh, the UAE to a certain extent, certainly Jordan and Lebanon, getting permission from the US to reopen ties to a certain degree um, against what you know, the the very strong third party economic blockade measures that Trump put in place called the Caesar sanctions. So uh, the Biden administration has not removed those, those laws, but it's been making exceptions more or less while maintaining the framework of a large number of, um, of laws that, that constitute this blockade. Right. And that, that's a very interesting point, because I, I, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, do you think they're acting of their own accord or they had to get an OK from the United States and Israel? Because, you know, the, the, it is a contradiction in how the United States uh, views Syria and how they view Syria now. Yes, they, uh, the U.S. Um, certainly gave permission to Jordan and uh, I believe also to the Emirates, Emiratis. They, uh, their foreign minister was here recently. It was a big deal. It was a, a diplomatic coup for Syria in a way. It was also a type of a green light for the Emiratis to proceed with investment projects, which they've been looking at. Uh, and they have some in train, but they've been holding back um, for the last three years. But I believe that's now going ahead. So I think they needed permission from the US. Of course, remember, all of these collaborating states are very vulnerable to the US. And Trump proved that when he forced the uh, the Emiratis and Bahrain, wasn't it, to recognize Israel, the so-called uh, what was it, the, uh, some other accord, some agreement where they- Abram Accords, yeah. Abram Accords, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned investment projects. Um, we, we, we know that there are the Caesar Act sanctions on Syria, which prevent other countries from interacting with the Syrian government from investing in Syria. Uh, so, so what are the limitations of these uh, normalizations or, or rapprochement? What can these countries do, if, even if they've, you know, on the surface, normalized ties with Syria? 
Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, you can also see that reflected, I suppose, in the role of UN agencies and international NGOs here at the moment. Now, I was in Hasake province um, a few weeks ago and I saw that there were there was a couple of uh, there was one NGO at least and uh, one UN agency working with the Syrian government there. But to avoid the sort of economic blockade measures that the US and the Europeans have, those agencies have to go through some sort of um, a maze, you know, to sort of claim exemptions under certain right. grounds to to do certain things. In other words, to get permission from the you know the the big power basically, and as the Lebanese did when the Lebanese wanted to make use of this um, Arab gas pipeline coming through Jordan and Syria to Lebanon, which may or may not happen basically. So they're they're constantly having to cover their backs, and it's been much easier for the international NGOs and and some and most of the UN agencies, not all of them. Um, to simply ignore that. UNESCO isn't here, for example. Uh, Syria has many World Heritage Sites, but there's no real UNESCO right. um, investment here. UNICEF is here. Somehow they've been able to help the Syrian education system. Most of the NGOs like uh, Doctors Without Borders and so on find it easier to keep their normal financial flows going and to come in on the side of the, the, the NATO, basically, or Israel. In other words, to, to go to Erbil and come into northeast Syria and to work with the SDF, um, Qasad, you know, and do their projects with the proxies of the US, because that way they don't put at risk their their finances. Right, and and uh, when Blinken, the Secretary of State, he, he says that uh, the United States opposes any attempts to rehabilitate or uh, normalize ties with Syria, um, is he just just uh, you know puffing his chest uh, in terms of uh, the official narrative? Meanwhile, in 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 the backdrop, they've lost um, this proxy war on Syria that's been going on for ten years now. So I mean, whether they like it or not, they have to normalize ties with Syria through their regional allies at one point or another. Yes, well, that's happening to a certain degree. I mean, it is it is bluster, but it's also, um, you know, they know they've been fighting a losing war in Syria and Iraq for a number of years now. They um, are making, they don't mind making exceptions for certain people and by, by which they still hold the power to prevent things from happening, basically. But, um, yeah. you know, it, it, of course, it appears that there's big contradictions because uh, the Lebanese are coming in, the Jordanians are coming in, the Emiratis are coming in. Um, the Saudis have been talking to Damascus also. Um, right. but that's not really out in the open yet. But nevertheless, the US is maintaining its posture that um, of a bad loser. I mean, they're always bad losers. Aren't they? You know, I recall Vietnam, they, were, they fought for at least seven years knowing that they were losing in Vietnam. Then they imposed... Right. Um, so-called sanctions blockade on Vietnam for a number of years too, which persisted into the 80s, you know, so that's why I wouldn't be surprised to see the occupation, US occupation. Remember, there's three occupations of Syria now. The two largest NATO armies, Turkey and the US, are occupying large parts of Syria. And of course, Israel has been occupying the southern part for, for 50 years. So, and, and notice also, by the way, that the US occupation is, and this may link into the the issue you want to talk about the the bombing of civilians in al Baghuz. um the u.s occupation is all along the border the the critical borders of syria on the eastern yeah. borders with iraq um, and also with jordan um, except for one point where al Baghuz is so the, one of the key points of the u.s occupation i believe is is to prevent the links strengthening between iran iraq and syria that's really quite a critical part of their classical divide and rule um, strategy. Yeah, and you you, you uh, mentioned the, the bombing, um, or the massacre rather, as it should be called, uh, which was unearthed by the New York Times recently. Uh, can you maybe walk us through what happened there? Because I think there's, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, misinformation, as putting it mildly, the, the, the US military have lied about what happened there. Could you maybe just walk us through the events that took place? Yes, I think you're right to say that it's one of the massacres, but, uh, but this particular one, which um, came out in the New York Times, is of a village which is right on the border of Syria and Iraq at the Euphrates, just below uh, uh, al Bukamal, which is normally spoken of as the major town near the border there. And that's been a critical, uh, it's been a hot point. Now, the US claims now uh, that this was part of their final operations against ISIS. But this is a facade because we know really they have been 
backing covertly ISIS for many, many years. Um, Joe Biden admitted it seven years ago, that he admit, admitted it indirectly that the, his close Arab allies were financed. And the head of the US military at that time, General Martin Dempsey, admitted that his close Arab allies were financing ISIS. And I myself went to a site in Deir Zor four years ago where the year before the US and the Australians had bombed the Syrian army to allow ISIS to take over the mountain behind the airport at Deir Zor. Now, the one we're talking about now, Al Baghuz village, is on the Euphrates. Um, it was March 2019. So, in other words, um, more than a year after all of the major operations were finished against ISIS, that ISIS was driven out of all of the major towns and cities of Iraq and Syria. And that was announced by General Qasem Soleimani, you might remember, who was the leader of that project. And also, by the way, the leader who decided to go from after the liberation of Deir Zur city from Daesh in um, October 2017, it was Soleimani that decided to go on immediately, straight away, down through Al Maidin, down to Al Bukumal, and take control of the border there. And that border site around this village where we're talking about now, where the massacre took place, where the U.S. admits the massacre took place, is where Iran has set up some facilities some security facilities, which has been attacked many, many times um, by yep. unknown forces, but presumably Israelis and the US. There's been missile strikes many, many times on the Iraqi and Syrian side of that border, the border crossing, which of course is the one border crossing that uh, Syria and Iraq are still controlling, but it's under heavy fire. Now, it just so happens, Al Baghuz is right at that point. So uh, <laughs> there wasn't really, there, there, there certainly are bands of ISIS still around Eastern Syria, but they've been effectively sheltered by the U.S. occupation in eastern Syria. And to some extent, the uh, I was told this in, in Hasake, that um, the Qasa, the SDF groups, which have a lot of ISIS prisoners, let groups out from time to time to go down to, for operations down near Deir Zor and down um, in southeastern Syria. In fact, there was a petition by prisoners in one of the jails there. There was a type of insurrection, and they were demanding to go down to Al-Tamp base, the US base, on the border of Syria, Jordan, and Iraq, because they thought the conditions were better down there, and the, the US was going to allow them to you know, participate in some other sort of operations there. That was, that was the story behind the, the, insur you know, the riot in one of the, the SDF-controlled prisons in, in Hasake province. So this area we're talking about, Al Bagus, is very strategically sensitive. Yep, yeah, that's that's a very excellent point. I don't think that was, uh, you know, mentioned enough uh, or elaborated upon in the in the uh, reports about this massacre in the context of where it's located. And uh, you know, as as you mentioned, the United States claims that they're fighting ISIS um, during this time. I mean. They they claim the same thing in Iraq, uh, and we can see what happened to Mosul, to to Raqqa. Also, I mean, they they flattened these cities uh, really, and they've committed atrocities, war crimes. Um, but they seem to get away with it, right? And there's this sort of hypocrisy here, where uh, when Syria is fighting terrorists, they say that Syria is indiscriminately killing civilians, but we don't hear that about the United States, right? It's as if it's all, there's always a, a good enough reason for them to do that. Do you feel there's a double standard there in, in uh, um, how this is treated by the media and the politicians? Well, certainly as regards the Western media, I mean, because they're very deeply embedded with the, with the Western states, aren't they, effectively? Um, you, it's not permissible um, in Western countries to contradict fundamentally the, the narrative that the US has re-entered Iraq, for example, to fight ISIS. Uh, we know it did no such thing. We know it sabotaged the fight against ISIS. We know that ISIS was only defeated in Iraq because the popular mobilization units were put in place and a new, when the Iraqi army failed and a new military force led by Mohandas and Soleimani, who Trump later murdered, were able to organize uh, groups in the region to defeat ISIS. Defeat ISIS. But um, so that has been a pretext. Of course, from time to time, they, they bomb people, they kill people. Also in Idlib, to some extent, every now and then they say they've killed an Al-Qaeda leader there. But we know that NATO as a whole has been funneling aid and arms into into that other side of northern Syria. i just make one other point about the um, al Baghuz, this village. Um, as I said, Soleimani and the Syrian forces took control of that area and that border crossing in late 2017, just as the the major uh, occupation of ISIS was defeated. Now, 
that is the area that's been attacked many, many times. So ask yourself, uh, 15, 16 months after that, when when the Iranians, the Syrians, the Iraqi resistance were embedded in that area, why would there be any ISIS target there for the US to bomb? Uh, right. This is really, uh, they wouldn't be a large aggregation of ISIS in that area anyway, because it's an area controlled specifically by the, the three powers, like Iran, Iraq, Syria. Uh, and of course, the, the incident that I documented a few years earlier uh, around Deir was was similar uh, in a way. It, it shed some light on this. It was a case where the, the US and Australians, and I think the Danes, some others went in, bombed the mountain behind Deir Ezzur, which was controlled by the Syrian army, killed over 120 Syrian soldiers, claimed it was a mistake. It was a well-planned operation, uh, but that operation allowed ISIS to take over the mountain to get strategic advantage at a time when there was still a battle going on for the city. This is in September 2016. Now, the US didn't come back and bomb ISIS on that mountain. They were very happy to leave ISIS there. And of course, as it turns out, they failed. They couldn't take over Deir Ezzur city. So, all of those operations in that part of Syria have been really clouded by this uh, mask, you know, this uh, false pretext that the US was there fighting ISIS. You remember also there's other important circumstances, admissions that you can use to bear on this question. You, you probably remember John Kerry about five years ago said they sat back and watched while ISIS was doing things that would weaken Syria effectively. Yeah. And he's referring there to, of course, to the fact that um, you recall in 2016, uh, the Syrians had to liberate Palmyra, that historic city in the centre of Syria, twice because yep. big columns of uh, ISIS from uh, from Raqqa and from Iraq came across hundreds of kilometres of desert and none of the US firepower was used to stop them. So the entire history of, uh, of the US operations against, so-called against ISIS in eastern Syria is, is riddled with these... Um, signs that it was a pretext. I, I spoke to a senior general in Deir Ezzur four years ago, uh, General Shahada, and I said to him after he was explaining how, <clears throat> and this was reported in the Iraqi and Iranian media a great deal, but of course not in the Western media, that there were these constant uh, uh, observations of collaboration between the US occupation and ISIS at that time. For example, uh, the proverbial helicopters picking up commanders and taking them out of areas in which they were being defeated. Uh, and this happened yep. in Afghanistan too, and happened in other parts of Iraq. So I said to General Shahada, I said, you must feel like you're fighting a US command there. Oh, sorry, there was one other incident. And that was, he said that a, a group of Syrian soldiers were attacked and killed in the desert on one occasion there in 2017. And it was not possible that uh, they could have detected them without satellite intelligence. So they believed that the U.S. were providing satellite intelligence to ISIS too. And so I asked him mm. if he thought he was fighting a U.S. command there, and he said 100% that the U.S. was directing ISIS operations at that time. That's what that's what the Syrians think. Yeah, yeah, but it's absolutely incredible, uh, all these examples. You know, it, it's, it's almost too hard to believe, but this is effectively what's going on. Um, uh, Professor, just, just perhaps as a last question, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but... You know, in um, in Afghanistan, just when the U.S. was was withdrawing from um, Kabul, you know, they drone striked the Ahmadi family uh, and claimed it was an accident after investigating themselves. And then here again, the United States military investigates itself and finds no wrongdoing. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, th th does that surprise you at all? There's also something else in the article. They mentioned that a thousand strikes hit targets in Syria and Iraq in 2019. They used over 4,700 bombs and missiles, and the official military tally of civilian dead for the whole year is 22 people. Do you believe those figures? No, of course not. But this is what they do, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's just they will always do it. You, you, you may recall the, the George Bush the first said after they shot down an Iranian civil airliner, I'll never apologize for anything the U.S. does. Yeah. In Vietnam, we had the same experience. Basically, they... Uh, even though they spoke of, you know, destroying a village to save it and those sorts of things. Nevertheless, that level of cynicism has been there for a very long time through very many wars. Yep. Professor, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming welcome. on the program. Very welcome.